So welcome um, to the first day of our differential expression bootcamp. The idea is that this will be a part of um, of our like LIBD plus collaborators boot camps. Now, you know, uh, we might run this um, with some frequency whenever we have new people in the institute that are interested in learning these things, um, these topics. Uh, but um, um, uh, it's kind of like a longer LIBD R stats club, but like uh, with enough time to go deep into a bit more. Um, why we're doing some things um, at Lever and um, or how we do some things. Um, so, um, so I send you the chat a link to this particular file, which is the one we'll be using for um, for the full bootcamp. It's kind of like a fancy Google Doc with like some code and several links and stuff that um, uh, that we'll be using. So the first thing is like, um, I wanna go over a bit of the setup. So um, um, I think all of you have been to our R club already. So you already probably do this anyway, but in case you're watching the video from home later, um, the, uh, the best thing is to install the latest R version on your computer. Um, some of you might have an R version from a couple of years ago and um, it won't uh, work with some of the uh, data and methods that we'll be using. So um, over here in the setup section, there's a link to CRAN, which is where you can download R. Um, this will depend on the operating system that you're using. So let's imagine that you're downloading, you're running R on Windows, you'll click there. And then uh, for Windows, this says like, this is what you want to install R if you're using it for the first time. Um, and so that will download an executable that you can um, start running and install R. Um, um, the next thing we'll be using is R Studio Desktop. And so uh, you can um, um, also go to this link, um, which will open a page on the R Studio uh, website, which I just opened in a new tab. And you want to download the free R Studio Desktop version over here on the left side of the, of the table. Um, so if you click on this blue download button, uh, it should automatically show you the latest version for your computer system. Today I'm working from my Mac computer. So that's why it's showing me R Studio 1.3.1 for Mac. Um, uh, that'll be different for each of you. So, um, can you let me know using the Zoom check marks that you can find uh, on the Zoom screen? There's a, a, a little button that says participants. If you click there, um, you'll see um, um, a set of options that say yes with a green check mark, no with a uh, red cross, go slower, go faster, and more. So, can you let me know if you have RCU and CRAN, uh, sorry, R and RCU that stuff already installed? In your own laptops. Does anyone need help with getting R or R to be installed? Yeah. Um, let's say you're watching this video from home later and you have some problem, you could sign up for a data science guidance session with one of us to get R or to get help installed. Um, R Studio desktop installed. Cool. Um, so I want to clear the check marks on Zoom. Um, so the next section here, this is, um, um, might get a change as the, uh, as the sessions progress, but um, here there's a bit of R code for installing a bunch of different R packages um, that we'll use um, um, throughout this bootcamp. That we need a lot of different R packages for like, um, uh, working with the data, uh, but also like um, there's some R packages that are related to the workflow that we'll be using, et cetera, and some other R packages for installing more R packages. So um, at the top here, we're, we're going to install the remotes uh, package from CRAN. Um, if you're new to R, uh, R packages are how we get access to new functionality. 
um, and they all the R packages have some documentation about them. So uh, we're going to install them from multiple locations. One of them is CRAN, which is the official like R uh, website. Um, so that's what we use remotes for. We're also going to be using uh, R packages that are related to high throughput um, um, high throughput biology, um, and those are typically hosted at Bioconductor. Um, so once we install remotes, we're going to use remotes itself to install um, the BioC Manager package from Bioconductor, which is the package that we'll use for installing um, more R packages from Bioconductor. Then there's a couple here like workflow related R packages that we'll be using um, for um, some of them, you know, uh, they're good to have available, um, uh, like our markdown itself, um, um, the session information package uh, for reproducibility, and the here package for looking in files, and etc. Um, there's one particular package that we have uh, made at the, with Andrew Jaffe um, at the LIBD called the Jaffe Lab package, which is only available through this. Uh, uh, through GitHub. So uh, we'll use the remotes package for installing that one. Uh, there's a couple of differential expression related R packages that we'll use. Uh, those are Lima, HR, Summarize Experiment, and Recount. We'll use, we'll use all of those at some point. Um, uh, there's a couple more genomics related R packages, uh, Cluster Profiler, which we'll use for an enrichment analysis. And there's this, a package that has a human genome information. Um, and a lot of what we do with R is making visualizations. We're going to use a couple of visualization related R packages. Um, actually, this variant annotation, I, um, I made a mistake. This is a, this is a genomic based one, sorry, not a visualization based one. But the visualization based ones are a P heat map, uh, which stands for pretty heat map, R color brewer for like different uh, color palettes, ggplot2 for making some plots, and plotly for making some interactive graphs. We'll also use the IC package from Bioconductor. And there's some a couple of extra ones that are used for making this website and things like that that you don't necessarily need, but uh, I mean, you can install them if you want to. Um, so the easiest thing you could do here is just select all this code and uh, like copy paste it into your um, into your um, R Studio session. So right, so you could just right click copy then on your R Studio window. Um, which I'll make, I'll zoom in. Um, uh, you could just paste it and run all of that. Uh, paste it and run it. Um, so, um, I welcome you to do that right now. And while it runs, I'll talk a little bit about the bootcamp plan. Um, um, and we'll pause if anyone has some installation problems. Um, so what is the bootcamp plan? So we're gonna meet for a total of six hours spread throughout three different days. Um, um, and today, uh, the idea is, um, so, Wait. Right, so, who is this bootcamp for? So, this is this bootcamp is for um, people that are interested in learning about differential expression analysis with Bioconductor. Uh, also, like people that want to know about um, the specific type of data that we've generated at the Liber Institute um, um, in RNA Seq and how you can uh, you know, basically learn how we have organized the data how. Uh, we present the data to our collaborators um, such that if you're interested in like uh, further, you know, um, you know uh, doing a more advanced analysis, you can um, understand a little bit of the, of the terms and common terminology that we use and how we commonly distribute the data. Um, so, um, uh, like you, you don't have to be a programmer uh, really to um, to follow a lot of what we'll do. Um, um, some prior experience with R is always welcome. Yeah? Um, um, and so you, let's say you're interested in like learning how to visualize the expression of a particular gene. 
we'll teach you some of the code for how to do that here. Um, and so later on, you have access to a specific data set that we've generated. If you want to explore it yourself, you'll, you'll have a template to follow. Um, so that's the idea of this, of what the next three days are about. Um, but that was the mo motivation for planning this bootcamp. Now, um, um, uh, if there, you know, you have other things you want to learn, we could always adjust the bootcamp. But currently, the, the, the plan is to go over on, on today a, a bit more on what is RNA sequencing, like just to understand a little bit um, the initial term, uh, uh, source of the, of the data. Um, then we'll go over our um, processing pipeline at LIBD called SpeakEasy, uh, which was made by Nick Eagles um, and other people at the Libre Institute. Um, and winter genomics and other places. Um, then we'll go over the R object that we use uh, for sharing RNA-seq data. That's uh, part of the summarized experiment by conductor package. And we'll finish with exploring some quality metrics today. Then on Tuesday, the plan is to start looking at gene expression itself. Um, then uh, part of what SpeakEasy does is that, is that it generates some information that can then be used for identifying sample swaps. So we'll go over a document um, that explains this for, uh, for one example data set. But then next we'll, we'll start looking at statistical modeling of RNA-seq data. Um, um, and then uh, once we have differential expression results, on Wednesday, we'll look at visualizing those expression, differentially expressed genes. Uh, maybe we'll do like a, a little like sensitivity analysis. Uh, and we're, we're also gonna learn about gene ontology enrichment analysis. Um, and I'll, we'll end with a little bit of like going beyond speakeasy. Um, so that's the plan. Um, let me pause the video. Um, all right, so um, let's continue. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, um, uh, this little page over here, this bootcamp page, you'll notice that like if you click on day two or day three, it's kind of empty right now. It only has the headings. So um, I'll update it later as the, as the bootcamp progresses. So let's go to day one, which is today. Um, and so we're going to start with this RNA sequencing primer. Um, so there's a, a link here to some slides, which you can open in, um, on a, you know, a tab, um, um, on a new tab, um, with some, some Google slides, which I'll use to, um, just to give a brief introduction to RNA sequencing. Um, uh, uh, the, there's an R RNA sequencing um, core group at the Liber Institute that um, will be, you know, more than happy to uh, uh, meet with you guys and uh, and like go over more specific details of the um, experimental protocols for generating the data. Um, but this will give us a little bit of a uh, of a um, of a common context uh, for all of us to to use as a base. So. <clears throat> First of all, um, let's jump into a bit of the, of the biology of what we're studying. Um, so we're mostly working with human RNA-seq data, but uh, the Liber Institute also generates uh, mouse um, RNA sequencing data. Um, and uh, both human and mouse and like rat and other organisms and cell lines, human cell lines, they're all like, um, um, eukaryotic organisms. So they have a common, um, um, the, the cells, uh, the eukaryotic cells have a common um, RNA-seq, uh, sorry, not RNA-seq, a common RNA um, processing machinery where in a little cartoon for a given uh, isoform of a gene, uh, it generates what's called the pre-mRNA, so the pre mature mRNA, pre, 
premature RNA or pre messenger RNA. mRNA can stand for like messenger or mature, um, mature. Eh. Um, and so what it has, um, ideally this molecule is, it's um, a single strand of RNA, but it's protected um, from um, enzymes in the cell that will like chop it up or degrade it. Um, and so those enzymes here are the, sorry, the, the protections for it are, there's um, uh, a five prime end and a three prime end. Um, and so, um, 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 sorry, this is before it gets protected. So this is in the pre-RNA phase, it, we just have the ply prime end and the three prime end. This, it might have some, what's called untranslated sequence, UTR. Um, and so this untranslated sequence can like help us a little bit uh, as a little buffer sometimes. Um, and it might actually have uh, regions of the RNA where like maybe some, um, um, uh, some molecules recognize it and, 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 and do different things with it. Um, next we have in our little cartoon here, red boxes. Those red boxes um, represent accents of that particular isoform. Um, and then the gray boxes represent intrants. Um, the red boxes or the accents um, are like really what's re uh, related to the protein. Um, um, that's going to be generated for, from this particular messenger RNA. Um, and so in order to actually get to, to that phase, we need to remove out the entrance and that process is called splicing. Um, and so uh, these borders here have a specific, a specific signatures that are used by the splicing machinery of the cell to identify in these gray boxes and remove them. Once we do it, all of that, um, removing the entrance um, 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 and adding some protections to both the five prime end and the three prime end of the RNA, um, we end up with what's called a mature messenger RNA that has a five prime cap, which has um, that protects this end, and normally it has a poly A, poly -A tail on the on the end. Um, and so, um, ideally, or, you know, even a lot of situations, if we're interested in protein coding mRNAs, right, we're going to be pro uh, protein, protein coding RNAs, we're going to be interested in, in quantifying the expression or the activity levels of mRNAs, of these mature mRNAs. That's because, like, let's say, uh, let's say maybe there could be like a lot of pre-mRNAs for a specific uh, version of uh, a specific isoform of a gene, but maybe, maybe, um, maybe not a lot of it gets um, processed into, into the mature mRNA or messenger RNA. Um, and so this is just one of the different types of RNAs that exist in a different model in a different, in a given cell. Um, and uh, they form a very small fraction of the RNAs in a given cell. Um, and so when we're doing RNA sequencing, we need to first of all find these mRNA sequences. And so there's actually two main protocols for doing that. One of them is called this poly-A RNA-seq protocol. And so the idea is that we have our, in this, in, uh, now in our cartoon, the full pre-mRNA is this blue rectangle over here that has a poly A, poly A tail at the end. And so <clears throat> uh, poly A RNA seq, what it does is uh, we want to start by uh, finding RNA molecules that end with a very long uh, uh, tail of A's at the end. And so that's easy to do because we can start with a, a, a sequencing primer that has a lot of T's, uh, which are the complement base of the A's. Um, and so that way you can capture only the RNAs that have a poly A tail. And uh, like, we're not looking at like whether it has any entrance or, or doesn't have entrance, whether it has a five prime cap or not. We're just looking at 
RNA molecules that have a polyaryl tail. And we um, assume that most of them, or the great majority of them, are going to be mRNAs. Um, and so uh, uh, once we capture those, then the, the processing of sequencing actually has to break up a longer molecule into smaller pieces. And we need to do this into smaller pieces because that's, um, that's what we're able to sequence. We're only able to sequence um, uh, uh, um, reads of about like 100 base pairs in length uh, using the machines that we use. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, once you have only the mRNA molecules of interest, they get fragmented into smaller pieces. Um, um, then there's a little like tag that gets active, added to it on the, on the re reverse strand. That's the primer here illustrating this uh, red box. Um, and we need that in order to then make, go from RNA to DNA. So this uh, C stands for coding DNA um, um, or complement DNA. Um, um, actually, I think it's coding. Um, but like um, we, um, uh, we use that primer to then make a full uh, copy of the RNA into DNA. Once we have a full DNA, uh, um, an RNA versus DNA molecule, then we can um, make the other, we can replace that RNA uh, side with a DNA um, copy of it. And now we're gonna have a double-stranded DNA molecule. Um, and so uh, there's a couple of like technical steps here that happen, but the idea is that we're going to be able to add to this, to this DNA some specific sequences uh, that are called the sequencing adapters. Uh, once we're able to glue those at the end, um, we're gonna be able to take that small like DNA molecule and then make a ton of copies of it. We're gonna make thousands of copies of it um, such that we're gonna be able to, um, to detect that this uh, copy exists, uh, this particular molecule exists. Um, so that's a bit of the idea uh, of poly A. There's another version of RNA-seq, which involves a ribose zero depletion um, process. And so um, um, the, this is a different strategy for dealing with the fact that in a cell, a lot of the RNA is not, is not the RNA that we're interested in. Right? We're interested in messenger RNAs. Um, um, a cell, though, has a lot of what's called ribosomal RNA, so rRNA. Um, and so one strategy that is different from this is to try to uh, find all those rRNAs and just chop them up and like um, and uh, get rid of them. Um, and so that's what um, this next set of um, steps do. And the idea is that we're going to end up with just the non-rRNA species in blue that we had from our first picture at the top. Uh, you know, this cartoon though shows that like all the reds got eliminated and we kept only the blue pieces, right? There's still a little bit of red sometimes left. Uh, it's a little bit of like uh, RNA is still left. This is because this is an enrichment method. Um, 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 and there's also a bit of other differences in the properties of the of the R of the RNA that we're able to study. So in this ribosome zero protocol, um, we're removing all the ribosomal RNA. That doesn't mean that all the all that is left though is messenger RNA, right? There's other species of, of RNA that are left, um, and so in particular, we go back to uh, our cartoon here, we might have pre-mRNA and mRNA left on a ribose zero protocol. Uh, so that means then we might have some entrance left, um, some, some, some specific molecules that have entrance on them. And so this image over here um, is showing like uh, two different data sets, A and B. Um, and in particular, the first two columns over here show them uh, the poly A 
uh, mRNA sequencing protocol versus the ribo zero sequencing protocol. And um, they show here like as, uh, as a stack bars, the percent of sequence that is either like uh, intergenic, intronic or coding. So the blue box over here is supposed to be the coding plus uh, uh, UTR. So uh, poly A sequencing mostly captures like coding um, um, data. Uh, and uh, there are, however, some um, reads that overlap intronic or intergenic regions of the genome. Um, some of them are not be, being able to align for this particular data set. And so why do we get some uh, red and orange or yellow? Um, so that can happen because uh, maybe the annotation that we're using is not fully complete, right? Um, we're always using uh, a reference annotation based on um, like most of these five individuals. Um, that's the reference annotation that we're using. Um, and so every human is different and there might be some differences there. Also like the, the annotation that we're using might not be um, fully comprehensive, right? So maybe we're observing some um, RNA um, molecules that exist that are not part of, of let's say, our encyclopedia of, of possible options, right? So that's why you can get here some red and, uh, and, and yellow. However, if you look at ribo zero though, the, the fraction of those two increases quite a bit and the fraction of, of, of um, coding decreases. Um, and so that's because of those pre-mRNA molecules um, that we're now uh, obtaining data from. Um, um, and there's other types of RNA molecules also. So that a ribo zero protocol will uh, generate data for. Um, one of them is called like the, uh, uh, like true ribo zero sequencing. You can keep uh, uh, um, um, uh, you can actually capture or sequence um, uh, long known coding RNAs, so LNC RNAs. Um, and so those might be of interest in some specific um, um, uh, situations. Um, and at the Liber Institute, for example, the, the decision was made to switch from poly A to ribo zero a couple of years ago. Uh, and some of the researchers at the Liber Institute were interested in in studying uh, uh, like long known coding RNAs and things like that. Um, so that's where some of, you know, some of those make up part of this increase uh, on their red and orange proportions um, that we see here illustrated with these two data sets. Um, so when we're talking about RNA sequencing at the Liber Institute, it's mostly either poly A RNA sequencing or ribo zero um, depletion. Um, those are the two main protocols that we generate data from. Um, um, and you know, we've done it over many years now. Um, so uh, once, you know, let's, uh, um, regardless of the protocol that you're using, right? Uh, the idea of RNA sequencing is uh, we go from the DNA to the genome, gets transcribed into a pre-mRNA, the entrants are removed and have a mature mRNA. We typically are interested in, in studying the mature mRNAs. Um, and so um, um, before fragmented, we'll either like do the poly A capture or the ribo zero. So that you know, step actually doesn't show up in this uh, cartoon here. Um, we're gonna generate like a bunch of small RNA fragments they're going to be reverse transcribed to generate DNA fragments. Um, uh, um, once we have DNA uh, fragments, double-stranded DNA, that's when we can use high throughput sequencing because high throughput sequencing was designed for DNA. It's not, it's not for RNA, right? Um, and so this whole step over here, this whole uh, set of um, experimental steps is called like the library preparation. Um, and so this is something that the RNA sequencing core at the Liber Institute uh, prepares. Um, um, so um, uh, it's, you know, ideally it's like all standardized, uh, but like um, 
the company that sells some of the reagents uh, changes them here and there a little bit. So <laughs> this is well, you know, differences across the years. Um, um, and uh, we use different machines. They, there's always like newer machines that have more throughput and things like that. But the idea is that these machines are going to take those DNA fragments, um, make a lot of copies of them in a way that we can then uh, 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 take a picture with a camera and see them with with, the, with, this, with these pictures. Um, how do we? How does that, that actually happen? Is that like it makes a ton of copies and then um, the processing of the sequencing is actually adding um, uh, one base at a time with different uh, fluorophores. Um, and so you get like um, uh, intensity signals for whether like that particular location in, in your image now has an A, for example, or a T or a C or a G. Um, and so I have a bit more slides on that process um, that we can go through. but. Um, um, the main goal of that sequencing is now to generate this small set of reads and have, you know, the, the actual DNA sequence, right? So these are like letters now. Um, however, that doesn't end the process of RNA sequencing, right? So uh, we actually, at this point, go from doing experiments to then doing a computational work. Um, and so one of the very first steps is to find what part of the genome do these short reads come from? And so that process is called the alignment. Um, and, um, and so in, let, let's say we have a reference genome over here in, that is a very long line. And so uh, alignment will find like, okay, these reads come from this particular region of the genome. These ones come from here. These other ones come from there, right? And, um, and you can couple the alignment with the annotation, which gives us the these black boxes with the arrows, which for example, let's say here we have a gene that has two isoforms or splice variants. Those are synonyms. Uh, so we have the splice variant A, splice variant B, um, and um, a particular read actually might span the union of these two exon exons over here. So let's say you have a read that starts at the end of this exon over here and it could actually end at the beginning of the second exon. Um, so those are what we call exon exon junction spanning reads. So that's the data that we'll use, but, um, but we need to go from this raw sequencing data into a set of file formats that we can use with the annotation. Um, and so the raw sequencing file format that is generated is called the FASTQ format. Um, uh, uh, the initial format for sharing DNA sequences, DNA sequences was called FASTA. And so they replaced the A at the end with Q for quality. And the file format here is, um, was initially a file format that had four lines for every read. Um, there's a couple of specific symbols that are used. So first of all, the every read every new read started with the aroba symbol. Um, and then after that, there was um, an ID for that particular read. And um, initially, Illumina machines, the sequencing machines, provided like specific details of where that read was generated from. So it's, it gave information about like, what was the specific like sequencing plate used, so the specific like, um, 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 piece of glass that we use for the sequencing and the specific like tile, the sequencing tile. So that piece of glass has a lot of different squares. So it gave the ID for that particular square that we use for the image. And then it gave images, uh, coordinates of that image of where it was generated from. Um, um, and uh, 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 whether it was like, let's say the first read or the second, if, you're if we're talking about pair then reads. Um, so that there was a lot of data that was uh, formatted into this um, sequencing identifier. Next came the sequence, which is like A, C, T's, G's, or N's. We get an N when like the sequencer doesn't know what uh, actual um, nucleotide we're talking about. Um, and then the third line starts with a plus. So this is now uh, 
telling us that we are going to have the quality information. And so in the initial file format for FASTQ, they repeated the full header information over here. Newer versions actually just leave it empty um, because that is a lot of text that gets repeated and you might not actually need it. The fourth line uh, is like not something you can understand just by looking at it like as a human, but this is the quality data that is encoded in a way that you can take these letters, for example, an A, and there's a specific set of formulas you can use to transfer that A into a value that is normally between zero and 40, uh, which tells, tells you how you know, low or high the quality is. Um, and so you want it to be at least like a 30, um, typically. Um, so this is like a very specific file format, not really like um, usable by like us humans, right? But it's, um, we have written a lot of programs and code that does it. And so this is where um, our particular solution at Libre comes into play. It's called the Speakeasy, um, which is our uh, processing pipeline that starts here. You can see in this red box, it starts with input, input fast queues, and we'll do a lot of things with it. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we're going to cover in this, uh, in this uh, bootcamp is how to deal with the, uh, the output files generated from it. Uh, in particular, we're gonna look at over here, this green box, which is a range summarized experiment objects. Um, and so uh, you can try to follow all the, all, the, all the arrows in the diagram to grow from the input fast QCs to this green box over here, the range summarized experiment objects. And so what's actually happening? <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff happening here. Uh, there's actually, um, um, we're gonna check the quality of the input data using a program called FASTQC. Uh, FAST, uh, QC stands for quality control. Um, and so that program will either tell us like, okay, all the data is looking good, you can proceed, or maybe there's a problem. If there's a problem, we're gonna go and do this optional step in, in orange called trimming. Um, and so that trimming, we'll run it, we'll, we'll again run FASTQC to see like, what is, how does the data look like after this uh, trimming step that tries to fix some of the problems detected initially by FASTQC. So that's why you see FASTQC twice. Uh, but after trimming, we'll, we'll, we'll assume that everything is kind of okay and we'll go to the alignment process. So this is where we're gonna go and try to find what part of the genome does the data come from. Um, and so this alignment process, you can go through it straight there's no problem. Um, and so uh, through an intermediate step here called infer strandness, which uh, um, is just like um, uh, an internal step run for by speakeasy to, to try to find like what type of data we're working with. There's uh, a couple of different variants of, of RNA-seq. Um, um, and so after the alignment, so this is where we find like what parts of the genome those reads come from we need to then quantify how active um, some specific genes are, or some exons or exon exon junctions. And that is based on a given annotation. So that blue square over here is how we'll quantify and we'll uh, do that to then, um, uh, once we have the uh, results from that for all, all, all our samples, we have some code that will um, take those output files and make this range summarized experiment object. There's a couple of, uh, of other steps. So um, sometimes um, um, uh, some of the samples that we have might have what's called ERCC sequences. Um, um, so these are 92 uh, transcripts that were designed to use as um, quality control metrics um, during the RNA sequencing uh, process. Um, like those protocols that I showed for like poly A or like a ripe zero have a lot of steps. And so ERCC will try to check that those steps are going well. Um, um, because you can end up quantifying um, what was expected out of those 92 uh, transcripts versus what you observed. And we'll, we'll play around with that a little bit too. Um, 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 
something else that Speakeasy does is that is is going to try to find um, the variance information for a, a, a set of um, of locations in the genome inside the coding genome inside the transcriptome really that uh, vary across humans frequently and um, we use this as a way to create a small like uh, what's called a RAN common file format file BCF that contains um, um, a couple of variants that we're going to use to then compare across all the individuals that we're generating data from um, and determine if there were any um, sample swaps. And so that's what we're going to do a little bit with tomorrow. We'll play around a little bit with the data generated here from this uh, other green box. Um, so the left green box, the first one on the left, and the fourth one, those are the main like outputs that we're going to be using um, through, through this bootcamp. And so that's why like this bootcamp is like going to be like a specialized towards the type of files that we generate at the Libre Institute uh, using the Speakeasy pipeline. Um, if you go and look at other uh, RNA seq uh, um, courses or uh, uh, workflows and things like that, they explain other tools that you can use for aligning and quantifying the data. Um, we don't, you know, the goal here is not to teach you how to run Speakeasy or anything like that. It's how to, the goal of this week kind of more to teach you how to use the output of Speakeasy, um, um, which is what we've done a lot. And so uh, to help us with that, we're going to use uh, an example data set um, uh, that was generated by Luis uh, Huki, Josh uh, Stoltz, and uh, Nick Eagles. He's the one that has been working a lot on, on the Speakeasy project um, um, and um, doing a lot of the code for that. Uh, what you saw is that, you know, that complicated diagram over here, that complicated looking uh, pipeline, processing pipeline. Um, um, Cool. So let me pause the recording. Uh, all right. So <clears throat> uh, Speakeasy is the software that uh, uh, the processing pipeline that we've uh, made for processing RNA seq data, um, and we have a documentation website for it that um, is basically complete um, or nearly complete. Um, and we're hoping to send a preprint about Speakeasy, uh, make it available publicly soon. Um, uh, once I have more time to actually uh, <laughs> prove some of the subject that has done, uh, I'm, I'm the bottleneck on this paper. Um, so um, this uh, uh, documentation website will be useful to, for us uh, throughout, um, uh, throughout this bootcamp. Um, one of the features I want to highlight is the search box here. So uh, let's say you're interested in learning more about ERCC. Um, and so this will show up all the different sections of, the, of this website that mentions ERCC. Um, 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 and so like some of the terms and things like that that, um, that we refer to, um, um, might have more specific definitions here. Um, um, and so this could be useful because I know that like RNA, seq RNA sequencing in general has a lot of acronyms. Um, and so hopefully this documentation website will be useful for you uh, if you run into any, anything like that. Um, so um, we don't need to like get into the full specifics of everything the pipeline does. Um, but just so you can get a little bit familiarized with, the, with what the, this website is, um, it's organized by chapters. Um, some of these chapters are really about like how will you run our uh, Speakeasy. Um, and so like the quick start shows an example of how you do that. Um, there's like a lot of options uh, that you can specify. Um, so those are you know, covered there in detail. But, um, the main section for us though that we're interested in is chapter number seven that is called the pipeline outputs chapter. Um, and so um, 
this image over here um, illustrates a little bit like what are the main output files that we're going to be working on. So we're, not, we're going to be working with uh, tables uh, that have one row per feature, and that will either be like a gene, an exon, or an exon, exon junction. We'll mostly be working um, on this WordCamp with the gene level information. And then it has one column for every sample. And so this is what we'll use for like differential expression analysis, visualization, and those type of, that type of work. We're also going to use a little table here that has the genotype calls that has one row per genomic position, one column per sample in this VCF file. And we'll use that for this identity resolution or the unswapping process. Um, just to show you a little bit of what, of what we do. Uh, this particular process actually needs some user provided genotype data, which at the Libre Institute is generated by Rand Powell um, and, and his team. Um, actually, Rand is here on the, on the call today, on the video today. Um, so this gives an overview of what those uh, main outputs are. We'll uh, dive a bit more into the rain summarized experiment object um, uh, from R in a little bit. Then <clears throat> today we're going to end up playing with the quality metrics data. So the section here, 7.1.1, the quality metrics, has a table here defining a lot of metrics. The first column here is the metric name, the second one is the description. And so these are metrics that are very specific to speakeasy um, and uh, uh, really like part of the goal of, of the bootcamp is for you to get familiarized with some of these metrics because we generate them for every single data set that is processed, processed with speakeasy. Um, and these are metrics that are uh, some other pipelines also generate but maybe with different names and things like that. Um, um, and so you want to get familiarized with them a little bit more. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so we'll, we'll refer to this uh, website quite a bit, specifically to this table, 7.1.1 7 quality metrics. Um, so it'd be good, like, you know, you can make a little bookmark if you want for all the main links that I'm, that we're going through in this bootcamp. Um, 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 but like I say here, we'll mostly be using the speakeasy main output files chapter. And so that's that chapter seven. Um, <clears throat> all right. And so uh, we don't necessarily want you to learn how to run speakeasy right in this bootcamp. We want you to learn how to uh, work with the output of speakeasy. And why do you, why do you want you to learn that? Uh, and that's because um, Soon, uh, Luis, uh, uh, Josh, and I are working with um, with um, uh, Johan on like releasing a lot more of the data that has been processed at the Libre Institute for everyone to use. And this will be both like the internal data that is not publicly available yet, but also a lot of the published data. And so uh, you're going to have access to a ton of data soon, right? Um, and uh, there might be some research questions that you're interested in exploring, um, you know, by yourself, uh, just by like looking at the data, right? Well, maybe you're interested in like, uh, what is expression of, let's say, SNAP25 on the MDD data set, for example, right? Um, and so that's a particular question that you could be able to answer after this bootcamp, uh, once we, uh, you know, give you access to the data. Um, uh, some of the data is already public per se, like the brain seek phase one and phase two data. Um, but like some of the other data is not yet internally available. Um, um, and so uh, there's a lot of different data sets that we have, but to make it easy for us and to just um, be able to learn about all of this with, um, with a small enough data set that we can load in our, in our laptops, we're gonna run with the speakeasy example data. So this speakeasy example data set has 40 samples from the bipolar project from Peter Zandi et al. Um, um, uh, the data is like publicly available already through, uh, through a website called Synapse. Um, and so um, let's look at the speakeasy example 
and I put the wrong link here. Um, so I'll just open, copy this link, open it into a new tab. And it's almost the same link as Speakeasy, it's just that the, at the end it has a dash example. So let me paste this into a text file that can make it bigger. So you can see it. Um, this is the actual link. Actually, let me paste it on the on the Zoom chat. So, um, um, this is a website that actually the bootcamp is hosted on. Um, so this one is um, uh, nearly polished. It needs a little couple more things, but it's um, quite complete already. And so this is this was made by uh, Nick Eagles with help from Luis Huki and, and Josh Stolz. Um, and so the way it's organized is that it has a couple of different tabs here. Um, and so uh, the first tab here called download example data shows how you can download um, the full like raw data, uh, but also the code for this um, speakeasy example. Um, and so for our purposes, we don't need to download the raw FASTQ data for the purposes of our bootcamp because we're not going to run uh, Speakeasy itself, but we will use the, the files um, uh, available from the Speakeasy example repository. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll look back to this, but I just want to, you to know, be familiarized with like the, the organization of this website. Uh, the next tab is about like how would you actually run Speakeasy with the example data, which um, uh, uh, we won't do right now. Uh, but like, uh, let's say if you're um, interested in like Fernando on learning about how to use the pipeline on Gypsy, you might actually want to try it out with this example data with the Gypsy um, uh, code that we have already. Um, so we won't use that for our bootcamp, but we will use this one called Identifying Sample Swaps uh, made by Josh and Luis. Um, um, and so we'll come back to this on the third, on the, um, tomorrow, I think. Um, we'll come back to this uh, script over here about Identifying Sample Swaps. Um, and then the one that we'll be referring to quite a bit is um, this differential expression analysis. Um, uh, 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 script that um, that Josh made uh, that has some of the things we want to do, um, uh, and we're going to expand it a little bit on our bootcamp. Um, so this gives you an idea of what are the things that we'll do, where's the code, etc. Um, so let's go back to the download example data, and so there's actually multiple ways that you can download the data. Um, um, if you're familiar with Git, you can directly clone the repository. This is a git clone is a command, the git command for downloading a specific um, repository um, and keeping it, keep, um, uh, making sure that you can keep it in sync with the original data such that if there's a new update, you can download it easily. Um, so that's one way of doing it. But like uh, another way, is to uh, use on R the use this um, package. So this is what I recommend you do for now. Unless if you're familiar with Git, use the, the Git option. Um, if you're not familiar with Git, then use the use this option over here. For, uh, from R, uh, run this use this command. Sorry, load the use this package, and then we're going to use a command called use underscore course. Um, and uh, with this very uh, long looking link. And so <clears throat> I'm gonna run this myself just an, as an example um, on my RStudio window. Um, so I'll, I'll load, use this using library. Um, and then I'm gonna paste that command. And so this will download to my desktop, a specific file. So I'll say yes to that. Um, um, and so it will take a little bit of time because it's downloading like a couple of files there. Um, and so then it's like, 
we want to delete the zip file after downloading. I'll say, I'm going to say yes, which is the second option for me right now, absolutely. Um, and so once that is done, this will open a new RStudio window automatically um, uh, for my speakeasy example, um, downloading files. Um, and so, um, the bootcamp introduction or markdown that's the one that has for example the code for installing um, the r packages and all of that um, and so this will make it easier for you if you want to run some of the commands again because you can for example okay i'm going to highlight lines 29 to 32 and just run them using command enter or uh, control enter if you're on windows command enter for mac um, so that way you can execute uh, some of the R code here directly without having to copy paste it. Um, and um, these downloads, all the files are gonna need for later on. So um, uh, I'm gonna pause the recording and let me know if uh, through the zoom check marks once you have the data downloaded. All right, so at this point, uh, um, most of us have downloaded the data um, and, uh, and we have our um, RStudio window over here uh, with the files and all of that. So uh, what I want you to do is to open the DE analysis R markdown file. Um, so this has quite a bit of uh, code already here uh, for doing a full differential expression analysis. And we'll, we'll go through all of it um, um, through as, you know, through the three different days. Um, um, so it actually includes a lot of code for setting up things. Um, and so I'm gonna uh, 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 just load, um, the data, and so um, we're gonna use. Sorry, I uh, I got ahead of myself a little bit. I'm gonna go back to the bootcamp intro because um, I want to explain how it is the data organized a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> um, let's load. I'm gonna run line 133 and 134 of uh of the bootcamp intro and then 137 here that's going to load the data um so speakeasy here did a lot of things for us and generated um a range summarized experiment object at the gene level that we're going to use so this rc gene is an object that we'll use quite a bit throughout the next couple of days um but if i just print it here on the terminal uh, on the console, sorry. Um, it gives quite a bit of information, but like if this is the first time you're looking at this, it can be quite confusing, right? So we're gonna learn a little bit more about what is this type of object in R. So it has here the dimensions of 60,000 rows times 40 columns. Um, and so we, you know, if we um, make a couple of associations, I said at the beginning that we were gonna work with 40 samples, right? So the number of columns here is the number of samples. What is 60,000 coming from them? That's gonna come from the number of genes. And so uh, on the bootcamp tab of the website, um, day one, um, we're right at this point, we're on 3.3 uh, on the summarized experiment overview. And so um, um, the summarized experiment, our package or biconductor package has quite a, bit of, quite a bit of information. And so let me look at the introduction vignette over here on a new tab. And I'm opening this mainly because of one figure that this vignette has. And so that's this figure over here. Um, and so this rain summarized experiment object is really like uh, the glue that holds together 
um, at least three different types of tables. And so one of those is the, a table that has information about the genes or the features, right? So this could be exons, this could be X and X and junctions. And it's going to have one row per, uh, per gene, let's say. Uh, then there's a big matrix over here in the middle that has one row per gene and then one column per sample. And so that big matrix in the middle is typically where we store the gene counts. Um, so um, the actual like uh, quantification results from our alignment um, process. Um, uh, but next to it, there's a third table glued to it that has one row per sample and then one column per sample covariate or sample metadata uh, covariate. Um, um, and so this is a much smaller sample, um, I mean, sorry, table um, that we'll use quite a bit. And you can see how they're glued together because one row on this uh, column table shown in orange corresponds to one column of the big count matrix. And then one row of the feature information, so one row of the table that has information about the genes in this case, corresponds to one row in our um, counts matrix. So uh, uh, this uh, figure or in itself is very useful to remember also some of the R functions for accessing this data. So you'll notice here that says like call data, um, SE stands for summarized experiment, um, assays for accessing the counts, um, row ranges or row data for accessing information about the genes. And there's a couple other um, uh, operations you can do. For example, let's say you're trying to subset uh, the summarized experiments where the DEX column is equal to the treatment, right? So that's how you can like uh, subset based on the column data um, and things like that. Um, um, and so we'll do some of those operations um, um, as we go through the bootcamp. Um, there's also a 2015 paper uh, uh, on nature, uh, or nature, nature uh, methods, uh, that includes um, figure two here, which is a different figure also for illustrating what a summarized experiment object is. And so it has some of those, you know, different cartoons, but also for showing how the different um, three main tables are linked to each other. Um, so this is a complex object um, um, and it can be confusing at the beginning. Don't worry about it. Everyone, um, 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 uh, everyone gets confused by it. Um, and, uh, but hopefully this, these images um, will be helpful for uh, as, a cheat, as a cheat sheet later on when you need to remember how to access different parts of the object. So that's the theory of it, the practice of it. Let's look actually at the example data that we have here. Um, um, and so uh, I wanna have on the left the website itself that has uh, the code and the output. And on the right, I wanna have my RStudio window. I'm gonna close a little bit this. Um, and so lines 133 to 137, those are the ones I use for loading the data. Right, then, uh, then I manually printed on the console. Uh, I manually typed in the console that I wanted to see that, uh, the data that we have, right? Um, now, let's try to access some of those three tables that we have. So if we wanna access the metadata, that's with the call data function here in line 143. If I execute that, it prints a lot of information because we have uh, quite a bit of quality metrics uh, for our example data. Um, um, so we have uh, one row per sample, we have 40 rows, and then we have 67 quality metric columns uh, from Speakeasy plus some of them that we manually um, added to this table. Um, um, and so a lot of these tables are explained in that Speakeasy documentation uh, link that um, and that is um, mentioned here uh, on the website. Um, and, and we'll 
we'll learn some of them as we go on. Um, uh, um, but like for example, uh, something we want we we might be interested in is the total map column, which shows the total number of reads mapped for each sample. So for example, this very first one has 160 million reads, um, out of which uh, 2.7 million map to the mitochondrial chromosome. So that is uh, 0 0.016 uh, proportion of the reads map to the mitochondrial chromosome. And this is one of the metrics that can be useful later on for, um, for quality controlling the data. Um, um, Another one that might be of interest, for example, is like the proportion of reads that got assigned to, to, uh, to gene coding regions. So that's on this total assigned gene column. Um, 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 one more that could be of interest is like the R RNA mapping rate. Um, so ideally this should be really small because we are trying to remove here um, um, our RNAs because these samples were um, sequenced using the ribose zero RNA seq protocol that uh, depletes our RNAs. Uh, but we also have information about our samples. For example, the brain region. In this case, we have data from the amygdala and ACCC. The race, which here is coded as um, African Americans or Caucasians or um, European descent. Um, the primary diagnosis, which is either bipolar or control sex, which is either M for male, F for female, age at time of death, and the LIBD uh, specific brain ID. Um, so that is data that is very specific to this example, this the brain region race, primary diagnosis, sex, age, death, and brain number. But that is actually a set of variables that we have commonly um, um, uh, provided in our, um, in our Libra data sets. Um, uh, so that's the column data. Um, next on we have the, the information about the genes. So that will be the row data. If you, if we use row data with the name of our object, that's going to print the table over here that has one row per gene. So in this case, we have 60,000 genes and a little bit of information for those genes. So in this case, it includes, um, 10, 10 variables of information. Like typically the, what you might be most interested in is the symbol column, which has like the actual name of the gene. Um, you might be interested also in the gene type. So some of the genes are putting coding. Some of them, for example, here, there's a mitochondrial tRNA. Other ones are like here we have an unprocessed pseudogene, et cetera. Um, uh, if you want to link this gene with other databases, you might have to actually use this, the gene ID. So we have like the gen code ID, which is very similar to the ensemble ID, but it has like a dot and a number at the end. Um, uh, some of those genes are part of the database called Entre by, by, by NCBI. Uh, some of them are not. So, um, so some of them we do have here, the Entre uh, the gene name for it, some, some that we don't. Um, we can also have like each of these genes has multiple transcripts. So we have here the number of transcripts that it has. So this first gene has two, the rest of them, like an example, have one except this other one here. Uh, and the first, you know, first ones that are uh, printed. Um, and we have the IDs for those gene transcripts. So there's a lot of information here about the genes, and that is very specific to an annotation we're using. In this case, I think it was gen code version 32 for, human, for this example data. Um, um, and so those pieces are fairly common across the different data sets that we're gonna be working on. Uh, the part that changes quite a bit is the, the information about the counts, right? So how, how many reads overlap each gene. Um, and so, um, Actually here we have you know, 60,000 by 40. So that's a lot of data to just print. So I'm gonna use the corner function from the Jackie Lab package to print the top left corner of the object. Um, and so we, we can see here that we have one row per gene using the gen code ID and then one column per sample um, ID. Um, 
And so there are zeros or 46, et cetera. Uh, so this, you know, exact values here will change quite a bit project to project. Uh, and so, um, um, uh, the D, let me, let me use here the menu. The differential expression document um, that we're gonna be using a bit, um, 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 you know, explains a little bit of the background, load some of the R packages. Um, but then here has, uh, it has a section here 1.4 where it's actually using some of those metrics that we have, so that some of the information that we have on the cold data, uh, and making some plots with it. Um, and so, something you might be interested in doing, for example, is a box plot. And so, uh, um, if you run this command, box plot of RNAc dollar sign rRNA rate tilde RC gene dollar sign brain region, this will do the box plot where the y-axis is the R RNA rate, so the left thing of the tilde, and the right side will be here the brain region. So we have the two brain regions. And so um, something like this is, you know, might be of interest because um, um, uh, SpeakEasy generates a lot of quality metric variables, right? And so even before looking at the gene expression, you might just want to exploring more detail than the, uh, the quality metrics that we have. And so you can do this in multiple ways, right? Like box plot here is just, is a, is a base plotting function, um, uh, but there are other things that you can do. Uh, and we've talked about some of those on the um, uh, LIV RSTETS club. Um, um, and so, um, uh, um, how does this actually work? This dollar sign syntax that we're using here, we're providing our range summarized experiment object, but after the dollar sign, if you use the exact same name as one of the cold data column names, so for example, we're here using brain region with a capital B, capital R, or we're also using um, R RNA rate with like, lowercase r, and then capital RNA, lower, uh, underscore R, uh, rate. We use that same spelling. That's one way we can access the information. Um, alternatively, and I'm just gonna copy this line. What you could do is uh, type cold data, open parenthesis, close it, um, and then use the dollar sign syntax. Um, so this is probably um, the syntax that uh, um, maybe more of you are familiar with because um, um, what is this doing? We're accessing the table of information uh, for the quality control metrics and sample metadata. And then at that point, because we have a table, then we're accessing a specific column with the dollar sign. Um, uh, um, so this syntax is completely valid, but they also made a little shortcut for us, which was just to directly use the object and dollar sign. So both of those syntaxes, syntaxes work. Um, um, so here I'm just gonna make the box plot again. Um, plots. And then, you know, there we have the plot again. Um, so this is how you can explore a lot of the quality metrics and, um, and, um, um, and it's something that is highly valuable because like every data set is different, right? And so um, here we can see, for example, the mitochondrial mapping rate, there is a bit of a difference between how it looks for the amygdala brain region versus the mitochondrial mapping rate that we have for the SACC uh, brain region. And so uh, it's up to you, like, I mean, like to determine whether there's uh, um, a biological difference that you're interested in, or if this is something that, uh, uh, that could potentially indicate a batch problem in how the data was generated. Um, um, 
uh, uh, we will look, for example, at the gene assigned, which shows like what is the number of reads that got assigned to a gene, uh, and we compare them between amygdala and SCCC. They look um, the two box plots here are fairly overlapping. Uh, we could also look, for example, at the mitochondria mapping rate, um, and uh, here, uh, Josh was using the race column, which we actually, I think, uh, uh, let's look at how many. It, we might only have one race on this object. Uh, yeah, they're all um, Caucasians. So this is all the same race, then like, um, uh, you know, it doesn't make a difference. But we can look at the mitochondrial mapping rate by brain region which uh, actually I think we already did here above. Um, um, so there's you know, a couple of things you, could, you might be interested in exploring. Um, and uh, um, uh, this document by Josh shows some of those first um, explorations you might be interested in. But let me go back to um, the bootcamp document. Um, so I had an exercise plan for you, which was to, uh, I wanted you to like, basically like be able to load the data, but then to expand the, um, the, the, the plots here using those quality metrics um, before we jump into looking at the um, gene expression tomorrow. And so um, we have, I have here two uh, links for sessions that we've done in the past in the R club, one of them quite on high quality graphics in R, another one on interactive graphics with Plotly. And so if you open the second link, the interactive graphic with, Plot, with Plotly on a new tab, that's what I'm doing right now. Um, this is a, uh, the link to our tweet from that particular session. Um, and so, um, there's a link to a Google Doc here, uh, which what has the notes for that session, and inside, inside all of it, like um, at the very end, there's a link to code. So um, I'm just showing the, you the full like path to the main link that I was interested in in, uh, um, in you finding. Um, and so this link, this code over here has code for exploring the quality metrics for the BrainSeq phase two data set, which is also, was also processed with like SpeakEasy. So there's some overlapping features, but it's, this was, this data set, the BrainSeq phase two data set is a bit more complicated than this example one. And so the exercise that I have in mind is I want you to, um, to instead of using the brain seek phase two data like we used in this particular session, I want you to adapt the code to run with um, example data that we have here. Um, and so some of the column names are going to change. You'll notice, for example, we don't have a mean total assigned gene uh, column name here. We, have, we, we do, however, have a total assigned gene column on the phenotype um, data. So, you know, maybe you just need to delete the mean underscore part. Um, and so the document here uh, includes like uh, a set of hints, right? So you first need to load gplot2 and plotly. Um, and then we're gonna make the, the phenotype or sample of metadata information into a table that we can use more easily. Um, um, PV underscore VF. And so at that point, we have an object similar to the one that we created on this example code on line 39. And so the, the rest of the exercise is basically adapting um, uh, the code that is uh, on this, um, from this session in the past to our data, right? So I, I left you here some of the headers for the different sections of code that we need to adapt. Um, and so I'm going to put you in small breakout rooms that, so you can work in smaller teams. Um, and let me 